live on LinkedIn Learning, YouTube, Twitch. Uh, there is a special guest today, uh, John, who is the head of the AI Product Innovation Master's Program at Duke. And you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Noah. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is John Reifschneider. I'm the director of the Master's of Engineering program in AI for Product Innovation uh, at, at Duke University. So I, I run our AI uh, master's program and, and teach a few of the courses in it and um, do a, a few other things as well that we'll, we'll talk about a little today. Cool. And, and maybe like you can say a little bit about your interest in like building AI products and 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 how that got you to where you're at now. Yeah, happy to. So a little bit about my background. I, I'm somewhat unusual in the academic world in, in that I uh, didn't spend my career in, in academia. I actually spent the vast majority of my career in, in industry um, building um, uh, software as a service products, um, some of which use AI and, and machine learning and, and others that didn't. Um, and I, I did a, a number of different things, um, different roles working with data and analytics, but, but my most recent role prior to joining the faculty here at, at Duke was that I ran a, uh, a business that provided uh, weather forecasting and predictive analytics tools for a variety of types of enterprise customers. So um, most of the major airlines around the world were, were customers of ours. Uh, about 80% of the major electric utilities in the country, a lot of the state um, transportation agencies, uh, some major professional sports teams, et cetera. Um, and so this was a business actually that had been around since uh, uh, the early 1980s um, and really had, had been a leader in providing uh, weather prediction and, and built up a great um, uh, roster of different customers that were extremely loyal to the company. But um, when I took over running the business, uh, which now is about uh, probably about eight years ago or so, um, it, was, it was sort of a stagnant business, not, not really a, a growing business. Um, a software as a service business provided um, services online as, as well as a mobile app. But what had happened in the weather industry is that uh, we've had continued uh, innovation in the quality of weather forecasts across the board have gotten better and, and better. And so, um, and, and prices have gotten cheaper and cheaper. And, and so when you think about the idea of, of providing weather forecasts uh, to make money, it, it's, it sort of seems odd because you probably have four different you know, free weather apps on your phone. Um, and, and so we've, we've, we're very fortunate to have these low cost or, or even free, uh, yet fairly high quality weather forecasting products available to us. Uh, but when you think about uh, a, a major um, uh, electric utility or a major airline, weather is, is something that has a major impact on their operations. Um, it, it's in fact, understanding what's going to happen with the weather is, is critical to their operations, knowing whether it's safe to fly um, uh, planes or, or not. Is it safe for, for this plane to take off? Uh, what route should this plane fly to, to ensure safety, to, to try to avoid any potential turbulence in the air, any severe storms? Uh, you think about an electric utility, trying to understand whether a, a major snowstorm or a, a maybe a major tropical storm is going to impact their territory and, and cause power outages? And if so, where and how many and how bad is the restoration effort going to be? Uh, these are organizations that care a, a lot about um, having a very, very high quality of, of weather prediction. Um, and and uh, so they are willing to pay money to get something that's better than what you and I you know, get for free uh, or for a couple bucks on our phone. And, and so that's that, that was our business model is we, we had some technology that provided a superior weather forecast that used uh, some sort of an intelligent ensembling technique to um, be able to provide a superior weather forecast. And, and that had worked really well over a, a number of years, um, but the, the market for uh, our services wasn't really growing. And so um, when I took over the business, we, we went out and spent a lot of time understanding how our customers were actually using um, the forecast we were providing. And, and it turned out what we kind of consistently heard from them is that they didn't really care that much about the, the weather forecast itself. What they cared about was what, what's the impact going to be for my operations. Um, so, you know, we were telling them how much it's going to rain or what the wind speed's going to be, you know, et cetera. Um, they would then have to take that and translate that into, okay, 
so does that mean that this plane can take off or not? Uh, and you know, does that mean there's going to be power outages or not? And so we realized that there was an opportunity to kind of go the next step and rather than just provide them, you know, forecasts of different weather parameters that we could actually try to predict the impact of the weather on their operations. Um, and so, so that's what we did. And we started building these tools and uh, this was, uh, about six or eight years ago, um, it's still somewhat early days for, for using machine learning, um, uh, um, uh, at least deploying anything that use machine learning. And um, so we started uh, building products that use machine learning on the weather data we had, as, as well as data coming from our customers, things like um, uh, routes that they were planning to fly. Um, in the case of the electric utilities, we use things like um, historical power outage data that they had, uh, we satellite data, et cetera. And we started building tools that, um, could actually predict the impact of weather on their, their operations, um, uh, and, and had a lot of success in, in doing that and, and built a number of tools that are, are used today by, um, uh, a lot of the major, uh, airlines, transportation agencies, utilities, et cetera. Um, and uh, that that experience running that business um, is, is what really made me appreciate the the power of the technologies of, of AI and machine learning and how they can be used in, in a, a lot of different areas um, to, to add value um, to create value uh, for for um, for customers. Uh, and one of the things I, I found during that experience is that. Um, you know, up until sort of really the last few years, you know, the idea of, of doing anything with machine learning and AI has, has really been kind of limited to a, a fairly small subset of the population. You know, typically your PhD uh, working in a research lab somewhere, you know, um, building uh, models. Often those models aren't getting deployed anywhere. Um, but we, we've had such great advances in, in open source technology. Um, uh, in, in recent years that it's really made the tools to do these things accessible to a, a wide variety of people. And, and what I found through my, my work experience and continue to find through my, my work that I do at, at Duke and teaching is that um, some of the most interesting and most valuable applications of these technologies are really coming from people that have a, a certain expertise in a particular field or, or domain, and then um, are equipped with the skills in machine learning and, and AI to go build uh, products that solve problems uh, for people in that domain. So in my case, uh, most of my team were came from a, a weather and meteorology background. And so we had meteorologists who could program and could you know, build things with machine learning. In other areas, um, it, when I look at my students, we have uh, 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 clinicians, doctors, uh, we have radiologists in, in the program who are learning how to use machine learning and AI to go build really fascinating things in, in the healthcare space, for example. Um, and uh, we have scientists likewise who are passionate about a, a specific area and, and want to get the tools and, and the latest technologies to go build uh, interesting things in, in those areas. So um, this has continued to kind of reinforce my, my belief that these are um, uh, technologies which really can be leveraged by a, a lot of people across a wide variety of fields to, to build some really interesting and, and useful things. Yeah, that's a that's a good uh, summary of uh, your background and some of the things you've been working on, and it fits with some of the the research I've done recently as well, and also my own you know work experience. So 2013 or so, I was I was working for a, a social media sports company, so it was like all sports, you know, and and similar kind of thing where we had domain experts who, you know, athlete handlers and you know, people that really knew that space and, and still around that same time, like 2013, maybe kind of similar area. There's just not much documentation about pu putting models into production. And in what we discovered as well was that once we started to get stuff working and, and we, we were able to predict like how much, ROI an athlete could could bring to a, to a platform, and now it's now that's actually a big deal. Like influencer marketing is like a huge industry, right. um, but 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 what we had, that that's basically how we generated all our growth. We discovered that the the um, brands and the athletes wanted uh, products that exactly what you said, which is that demonstrated ROI, and it and it seems like now twenty twenty two and beyond, 
that that now that's the focus of of ml ops is in a sense like sure there's technical things like feature stores which you know maybe you need it maybe you don't but the the reality is it seems like it's the roi that's that's what people are are, are really trying to, to 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 harness is and so how do you get roi is it it sounds like it, you're and i agree with you that it's the domain expert and like the high level tools yeah exactly uh, I, I think that what's been going on with, with ML, ML ops is, is further accelerated this, you know, this trend towards uh, a, a focus on getting, getting things into production, not just building, you know, nice prototypes and, and things that uh, work in the research lab, but, but things that are actually useful in, in production um, to users. But, but, you know, one of the, one of the important skills, you bring up a good point. One of the main skills to, to do that is, is understanding um, how these technologies can be used to solve real problems. Um, because in a, when you're building something in a research lab, you, you don't, you're not always under sort of the same impetus to, to prove that you're actually solving an important problem that people care about. But when you are getting models out in the production and, and you know, commercializing that, it, you know, in terms of selling a, a service or a product to users, you, you very quickly find out um, whether you're solving problems or not by whether, you know, people are willing to pay for your service or not. So, uh, it also in, involves a, 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 um, a, a skill in terms of understanding uh, how to identify problems and, and how to frame solutions to problems. Uh, and that's one of the things we, we also put a lot of focus on in, in my grad program here at Duke. And, and I find that this is not necessarily a natural skill for engineers. I mean, I, I you know, when I was an undergrad, I, I was about as, as hardcore of an engineer as, as you could get. I, I had no interest in thinking about anything relating to business. And, and I, I think a lot of folks are, are like that. And then I got out into the working world and I, I realized that to be a successful entrepreneur, you, you also have to understand some things about how to build successful products and successful um, yeah, companies. And, um, and, and that is a kind of a skill set that you have to train, um, you know, through experience. And I, I find that in a lot of my students, and we have about, about half of our students come from um, come from directly from undergrad uh, versus going and working a couple of years first. And in particular, the folks that come right out of undergrad, they come in and, and one of the first things we do is we, we ask them to work on projects where they are, are open-ended. So they get to choose um, their topic, but they have to frame it in terms of go find a, a problem and then, um, and then think about how you can build a solution to this problem that uses machine learning in some way. And, uh, I, I find that a lot of students tend to struggle with that with that assignment because they're used to a professor just handing them a problem and saying, "Go, you know, here's the problem, here's the data, go go solve this problem." Um, and and the idea of having to go find a problem for themselves to work on it can be really um, intellectually challenging for for them. Um, and and they come and they say, "How do I find a problem? I, I don't know where to look or how to identify whether something's a problem or not." And so then we, we go through a lot of you know, work on, on that to, to um, uh, kind of train them in, in terms of how to identify problems, things like going out and actually talking to people and, and understanding the problem, you know, usually is the best way to do that. Um, so it's, a, it's an important skill, I, I think, and will become more and, and more important as the focus of the whole machine learning area really shifts from kind of building really you know, powerful and, and um, uh, performant models in a lab to actually using things in, in production. Yeah. Th th there's um, it's interesting because the, so I, I just got done taking the Google professional machine learning exam because I'm building a course on it and they heavily put uh, problem framing in the certification. And I agree with it. And, and I agree with the approach, which is that, you have to be able to frame the problem correctly. Like, like one of the, I won't, I, I, I think I am not even allowed to say what, what I won't be specific, but let's just say hypothetically, if you're going to frame a problem as a, you know, you know, you, you're someone asked you to solve, let's say uh, um, a bus problem, right? Like where you have a, you have like, you know, a, a bus that takes people somewhere in, in the Bay area and it, and it picks up people in the desirable places to live is that a machine learning problem 
or is it a different kind of problem? And, you know, like, well, it's classic optimization problem, right? With, you know, it's the traveling salesman problem, right? So you don't need machine learning for that. It's a cool problem, but it's yeah. not, it's not a machine learning problem. Yeah. And so if you don't have the ability to, to differentiate between like a heuristic versus a machine learning problem, then that, that, that could really be a problem for your organization because you, you're trying to solve heuristics that could easily be solved with, a, you know, 50 lines of code mm -hmm. and trying to make it into an ML problem. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And uh, I teach an intro to the machine learning class for our, our new grad students coming in. The, the first week we spend time um, on uh, how to determine whether um, a, a problem is best solved by machine learning versus by heuristics and, and business rules. Because I, I find that a lot of people actually struggle with with understanding that and and the natural inclination is to think oh this is this is definitely something i should use machine learning for um, and, and i i actually really try to discourage that uh, to be honest with with my students um i, I try to instill in them the, the mindset that um, you should only really use machine learning when when you find you you can't solve it a, a different way um, because there are a lot of a lot still a lot of challenges to, to involved when you're using machine learning um uh, you know, trying to set up and maintain data pipelines as, as data is, you know, is changing, you have drift and other things going on, um, performance of models de degrades over time when things are in production, um, uh, there's bias issues, there, there's all sorts of problems with using machine learning. And so I, I try to encourage them always, always look at heuristics as, as the first place to, to consider when you have a problem that you're, you're trying to solve. Um, and, and, um, and try to solve your problem with heuristics, see how far you get. And, and if you're not satisfied with where you are, how well you're solving that problem, then um, start looking at machine learning. Um, and, you know, a, a certain percentage of the time, heuristics is, is all you need. And you can just stop there and you don't have to go any further. But um, then I also tell them, even if you do find that you need to resort to machine learning to solve your problem, at, at least at this point, you have a good baseline. So you know what performance you might reasonably expect with, with machine learning. Um, you know, uh, another challenge that I find students have is, is getting hung up on, on metrics. Um, you know, they see something like, you know, 98.5% accuracy and, and they think this is, this is amazing. Uh, but is that actually good or bad? I, I don't know. Um, you know, metrics are always relative, right? So, you know, maybe one method you're getting 98.5, but another method you get 99.7. Uh, so maybe 98.5 actually is really not very good. Um, but you don't know that until you have some baseline that can pair against. So I always try to encourage them to create a baseline solution using heuristics. Um, pick your whatever metric you're going to use to evaluate the performance of that of that system. See how it performs on on heuristics. And then move on to machine learning, and, and now you have something to compare against and see if you can make it. Yeah, it, it reminds me actually of um, the first time I built a recommendation engine. That the the the, the and these are things that people don't tell you, and there there was like no information that I could find even about it at the time in the real world. Is like here's a few different things that happen. So one is you have no data. Right. So how could you possibly build a recommendation engine? You have no right answer. So, so the, you, you have to use a heuristic and there's some good ones, right? There, there's like the, there's the, um, you know, basically similarity, right? Like you can just take a, you know, like a, a matrix of what things people, you know, collaborative filtering, like what people liked or mm -hmm. who they're associated with. And then do, you know, basically look, do a, do a decimal or a, you know, uh, a, um, like a, a fraction that basically says like, you know, like you're 90, you're 90% as similar as this other person. This person and yeah. And like, what do they have that you don't have? Right. Oh, yeah. you know, it's, it's a heuristic and, it, and it's pretty good. Huh? And, and it's funny how, you know, I, I remember working with some, some people from a, a company one time and, and, and they were like, well, this isn't machine learning. We can't do this. It's like no, we can do this. We that, that's we don't have actual ground truth data. We have no idea. This is a like this is that how you implement things, and 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 that's that's a you know something that I think more people should be okay with. Is like look, especially the cold start problem. If you have no data, you can't 
you can't be a purist and then and then say, oh, well, we can't build a recommendation engine because because like it's not ML, you know, like and then and then that's that was one part of it. The other part. So then once you do build an ML uh, recommendation engine, there's the other part that people don't talk about is is the user experience. And so here's a perfect example. And, and I see this all the time since I built one from scratch. I, I, I see this sometimes as like, hey, uh, you know, you should connect to this person. And then and then you're like, actually, I don't want to. And and, and then like, what do you do? You're like you, you there's they keep telling you to connect to someone. You're like, yeah, I really yeah, don't I want that. to connect to this person. And then all of the connections eventually will be uh, like recommendations will be people you don't want to connect with. Yeah. And so now you have to build a different user experience that lets people blacklist things so that fresh recommendations come in. And so those are the, again, like a subtle little u user experience thing that you don't really understand until you've actually built it from scratch. And then second, if you didn't start with a heuristic, you 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 may not even like get to, to to experience early and fix some of the real significant problems with ML. Yeah, I find that user experience design of, of ML AI based products is, is a, a field that um, really probably doesn't get enough attention right now. And it's only going to be more important as more and more products um, start integrating machine learning. But um, and, and I'll give a little, little plug as well. I, um, I created a Coursera uh, specialization last summer, and one of the courses is human factors and AI. And, and we talked a lot about these types of things. And I, I felt it was important to do because there, there wasn't a, a lot out there, um, at, at least at the time, on this on this subject. But there, there's a lot of unique aspects to consider when you think you think about the experience of a user with a product that's using ML and, and what you just mentioned is, is a prime one. Um, what if you don't like the recommendations that, that the ML system is giving you, you know, the connections that are, are not your friend, you know, you have no interest in uh, products that it, it's recommending to you that you have no interest in buying. Um, I, I give an example in the, my course of, um, uh, uh, on, um, you know, is, is one of the leaders in recommendation systems and they, they do some great things and they use a variety of different types of technologies. But um, um, it, they occasionally, they, one thing they have a hard time di distinguishing between is when you buy something out of necessity versus out of desire, right? Because there's different motivations for buying something uh, on Amazon. And in this particular case, somebody had bought a new toilet seat on, on Amazon and the, the lady then started getting emails and when she went to the, the Amazon website is recommending her toilet seats. And she, it, it's not like she collects toilet seats or has a particular interest in buying more. It's just that she needed a new toilet seat. And, uh, and, and this is a case where, where, you know, a lot of times we buy something out of necessity and, and it's a one-time, you know, yeah. it's a one-time thing. You don't, you don't want to buy more toilet seats um, versus when we buy something out of desire, then maybe we're interested in, in buying some more. So this kind of, integrating this feedback loop with recommendation systems yeah. where as a user, you can provide yeah. feedback is a really important thing. And I think the, the, it's interesting recommendation engines, as I've gotten more experience with them in the real world and, and also just been kind of studying them the there's, there's another aspect, which I think is an interesting one, which is, which you're, you're kind of starting to highlight is that, is it even useful? And I think that's a very interesting question because one of the the data projects I did a while back for UC Davis's graduate school of business is I taught a like no code, low code, like uh, kind of guest lecture. And, and I had never seen this data set before, but it was the Amazon uh, product review data set. And mm -hmm. we, we, we had basically, you know, 100 MBA students all break into teams. And it was like, okay, you have two hours, just do anything you can. And, and it was pretty cool actually, because like all these different ideas were, were surfaced and, and I just would never have discovered this on my own if the students hadn't figured this out. But what we discovered was that actually there was a lot of like, um, brigading happening with the reviews where there'd be like a thousand 
like one star reviews on like one day and it's like yeah oh like you know in and like you're you're killing your competitor oh okay right and then it's like well what what is that data feeding oh it's feeding amazon's recommendation engine so then i mean like when you get a review from amazon like are do they actually take account for that I, it seems like they don't I mean, maybe they fixed some of this since then, but like, and then recently, um, as well, I, I've, I've read a lot of stuff about Glassdoor and I think Glassdoor is another fascinating one that there, I used to, to actually live right next to them because I would drive from, um, Marin County uh, into the, the city all the time. And they have this really beautiful place run in Sausalito and they, uh, if, if you look at the top tech companies, the Wall Street Journal did an article where there happens to be certain days where there's like a thousand five star reviews of the CEO. <laughs> it's like it's like I'm it's like, like huh, oh, that's interesting. And it, and then and then it's like why is it that all of the top tech companies have such good CEO ratings? And then if you look at the flip side, if you look at a startup, I mean, you know, if there's first of all startups are are just really difficult but but you know if there's 20 people at a startup this is you know basically the un unbalanced data set problem in in addition to like you know data poisoning problem is you look in the 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 startup and it's like the ceo's garbage and, you know maybe they are maybe they're bad but like if you're a startup you can't like tell 10,000 of your employees by the way, we would strongly encourage on March 1st, 2023, that you give a five-star review to the CEO strongly. And on March 2nd, we're going to have a margarita party. You know, we're like, like, so there's, it, it almost makes me kind of think about like this concept of recommendation engine itself. So that, that's one negative. And then another one that's an interesting aspect of it is that, you know, obviously the um, s some of the stuff that we've seen about, you know, conspiracy theories and all the misinformation and and I don't know what the the how to quantify the the number of, of, of dollars that have been made from, you know, like basically things that harm people, you know, and and what was interesting is I actually had a discussion and I won't name the company. I'll just generically, I had a discussion from the head of AI at one of the top companies in the world on LinkedIn. And, and he, with a straight face in the, I'm assuming when he, when he responded to, to a critique, I had said it would be much worse uh, if we didn't have our recommendation engine. And, and I have to say, I don't, buy that i don't buy that your recommendation engine because again i've built a recommendation engine is it would be would be better than just either a chrono chronological feed or the uh, the other one that would make no money is you just there is no feed right and so i i think these are the, these kind of ethical interesting things about uh, recommendation engines there, there's so much stuff going on that that people that are not you know in the industry are not aware of. Anyway, those are just some thoughts. Yeah, I, I, all good thoughts. I, there are definitely a lot of dangers with with recommendation systems, and, and you named a, a few of them. Um, one of the things that really concerns me is is that um, so generally I, I I I am a fan of recommendation systems. I, I think they can be very useful and, and powerful, but. Um, one of the big issues with them is that they they tend to give us sort of blinders. Um, you know, they they it's like like a horse. You know, if you've seen race horses and, and they you know have blinders on, so their field of vision is narrowed to a very specific area where the jockey wants them to look straight ahead and you know, not be looking at the sides. And that's kind of what um, recommendation systems do for us when you think about it. I mean, um, you know, they control what. YouTube videos we watch, what what music we listen to, what shows we watch, what movies we see, what products we buy, and what clothes we buy. I, I mean, and they, they they do that by narrowing our, our field of vision in. Um, they try to make a, an attempt to learn our preferences and then narrow our field of vision into those preferences. But that that can go really wrong, right? I mean, you know, the, the, the main, I mean, this has brought, been brought up a lot of times with YouTube, um, but they're certainly not the only one. When 
you go on YouTube, you see some, you know, they have the suggested videos. You see some video, you maybe you accidentally click on it. Maybe you intentionally clicked on it, but you know, you just want to see what it was. And now all of a sudden you're getting, you know, more and more videos of this thing. And, and maybe it's kind of a polarizing or an extreme thing, or maybe it's misinformation. And, um, and, and now you're just flooded with it because now it's starting to think that you, you want more of this stuff. Um, and, it takes you kind of deeper and deeper down that, that rabbit hole, um, you know, showing you more and more of the same thing. Um, and all of a sudden you, your worldview has gone from this to, to like this. Um, and that's a, that's, that's really a, an issue. And I, I don't, I, I'm hoping, I, I don't know the details, but I'm hoping companies like YouTube are, are have found ways to, to improve this or are working on them. Um, but the I, idea th I think actually that they have not. And, and part of it is, that I think the AI industry is is has is a little bit behind in terms of ethics in that they talk a big game, but in practice, you know, if you look at even fossil fuels, you know, there's obviously some significant issues in the fossil fuel industry, but people are well aware of the negative externalities of, you know, you light trash on fire to warm yourself. And then, you know, everybody in your town gets, you know, some kind of uh, plastic toxin poisoning, right? Like that's, the, that's, the, that's the negative externality, but, but, but there's actually been, I think not really a ton of, um, of uh, insight into the negative externalities. And I, you know, I think a few, a few examples of this are this uh, doom scrolling or reading the news kind of concept is, you know, how many people maybe 10 years ago, even, or even five, let's say 10 years ago would spend six hours a day reading like, uh, you know, different news stories. And, and then how many do it now? Like I, I remember when I was in the Bay area walking around and, and the entire city, was like this and they're just looking at a phone and, yeah. and, and putting themselves into danger actually. And so, you know, this concept of addicting people to, you know, outrageous content is very lucrative. I mean, it makes a lot of money mm -hmm. and many companies, their business model, that's their, their, that's their, their, their key um, metric, right. Is engagement. Yep. And, and so, you know, I, I think the legislation has not caught up with it. The, you know, consumer advocacy, advocacy groups have not caught up with it the leadership of companies have you know basically you know not not done anything about it so so you know i, I what i'm curious about is for the companies they they i know for a fact they're aware of the problem like again a head of ai at a big company said it that that they're aware of the problem i don't agree with their solution but what i'm curious about is is if these companies are are aware of that, that they may have an, an existential threat to their business, because if let's say the European Union, which is probably one of the stronger hopes mm -hmm. uh, of fixing this, or maybe even China, they, they start to, to start cracking down and say, oh, by the way, you're addicting people and we're going to sue you. Oh, by the way, like your recommendation engines are a negative externality and we'll fine you a hundred million dollars a day. Like, I wonder if any of these companies are, are basically going, hmm, when is that day going to come? Because then our entire business model is is, is gone. Gone, right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you have to think at, at some point that that will happen. And, and um, uh, you're right. I, I mean, it, 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 the the sort of addiction to, to social media and, and the, the doom scrolling is, is – um, is there and it's just as dangerous as, as something like nicotine, um, right? That um, it addicts people, and, and it's not necessarily in their best interest uh, to consume it, but but they do because it's it, it feels good in the moment and it's addicting. And um, you know, whereas things like you know alcohol and, and nicotine, you know, society as a whole is, I think, done a pretty good job make educating people as to the the dangers of those things, so they can make informed choices for themselves that's not the case with, with social media, right? There hasn't been enough awareness of the negative externalities of, of these things. Um, and, and obviously the, a lot of the companies that, that, um, that, uh, provide these services that, um, you know, they're incentivized by uh, making money, which they do largely through advertising and they maximize advertising by maximizing engagement and maximize engagement by you know, getting people addicted. So they keep coming back. Right. And, and that's how they, 
those are the metrics they, they track is engagement metrics. Um, and so as long as that happens, there's, there's incentive to find ways to get people more and, and more engaged in, in their services. And that's, I think there's probably not enough awareness of the, as you said, the, the negative externalities of that and the impact that can have on, on people's lives, both on the part of the, the, the companies themselves, but also the individual people. I, I think for us as individuals, we, we probably really aren't aware or don't, you know, certainly not to the degree of, you know, other, other similar types of products or services. Um, we're just not aware of the, the negative consequences that that can yeah, it, have it, on it, our it, mental health or our time, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the one that comes to mind to me is like most of my life I've read, I would say at least a book a, a, a week, at least really? many times, two, three books uh, a week. And, you, you know, I noticed that like, why am I not reading more books? Oh, I'm reading like the news, right? Or, you know, I'm reading like stuff that's just garbage. And and you, you just wonder about the effect that has on society of like people that are that are working on things that are, are stopping people from reading, you know, like information, like actual information. Like, you know, if again, if you, and you put this up in the hypothetical and you said, you know, in 1980, we're going to take 90% of the people that read books and we're going to, replace that with like outrage stories from a news feed that 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 sounds like you know dr evil you know <laughs> like like a bond villain would, would yeah. do that yeah I, i'm the same way and I, I get the same issue i i i wonder as well why why that why can't i seem to find more time to read I, i've got a massive stack of, of books to get to and uh, and and that's a similar answer for me I, when i look at how i spend my time i i realize i i spend time reading news that I, I probably don't really you know, need to read or, or I could condense the time. Certainly. Um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm off of Facebook, you know, Twitter, but, but I, you know, I'm still on LinkedIn and I spent some time on LinkedIn. Um, do I need to spend that time, you know, every day or, or not? So um, nobody's immune to it. I mean, I, I admit myself, um, you know, I, I'm susceptible to uh, spending time on those things. And, and then I, if I step back, I think, is that, is that really the best way I should spend my time or should I be using that time to read every day? Yeah. I, I um, have a service called uh, next DNS. Have you heard of this? No. Yeah. Um, it, it's a pretty interesting service that, uh, that I'll put it into the, the, the chat here is that it's, it's what, what's interesting about it is you can create, um, like, I don't know what it's two bucks a month or something. You can create like a customized DNS service that actually like filters out all ads period. Like they just get wiped off of the face of the internet. So that alone is worth the service yeah. but then you can explicitly block sites. And so what I, what I do now is I just, I have like a whole list of like news sites. I just don't read because I, I find like even the most high quality news, like even things like New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, all this Bloomberg, that honestly, I could condense it into a book. And so I've actually, I've deleted, I, I can't see those sites on my computer. And and I found the productivity boost is just off the charts. Like, I mean, from, from, from doing that. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll take a look at that. That'd, that'd be great. I, I even, I mean, even article, news articles, I, first of all, I, don't want anybody to misinterpret our, our comments. It, it's important to stay up on what's going on in the world. But um, I find when I you know sit down, and I read news sites. Uh, um, either I end up reading stuff I really probably didn't need to read um, um, was more entertainment than you know the news value, or or I, I just spent five minutes reading an article where I could have spent ten seconds looking at the he headline in two sentences and, and moved on. Um, it's just too long. Um, yeah. Uh, maybe maybe it exists, but it'd be kind of neat to have a news service that was just like you know maximum you know three to four sentence uh, articles at a time or something to consume. Yeah, or or, or I mean, the do, do you you know this is also kind of a an ML ops problem is like do you even need that? Like, you could you, instead of getting the the news at the time interval of every hour, you know, do is it better to get it every month? Like, yeah. and, and and that's the case for things like the Atlantic or the New Yorker or, you know, or the economist or where you, where it's like, honestly, is it better for you to, to just read a magazine, you know, and, and get like a, a 20 page, you know, article on some topic yeah. probably, I mean, you know, is it, but it's bad for the company. Right. 
Right, exactly. Yeah, I, I found that for me, actually, the best is um, I have a few different kind of daily you know, newsletters. I, I wake up in the morning and, and in about 30 seconds, I just scroll, you know, they send a, a daily kind of summary, you know, with just headlines or maybe a sentence or something. And um, and, and those are great because I can spend about two minutes and I can get caught up on all the news and, and move on and not have to you know, spend other time reading articles. And the um, the other MLOps thing that I wanted to bring up was, uh, you know, because I'm, I'm I'm working on this enterprise MLOps book yeah. for O'Reilly is is uh, I went back to some of the business school things I, I had read in the past and the that concept of uh, good to great, you know, came up, which was a you know classic uh, book about like studying what made companies go go from good to great, and it was it was interesting to, to kind of tease out that that the one of the criteria that the uh, author had i think jim collins said was that the companies that y- that they use technology as an accelerant were the ones that went good to great not the ones that tried to make the technology become the focus of the company and I, it just got it really got me thinking about ml ops is like that and, and and this goes into some of the stuff we both do is like that you know if you think about in machine learning, you know, there's many ways to do it, right? You can train the model yourself. You can use a pre-trained model. You can do transfer learning, tweak a pre-trained model. You can use an API. And, and, and I think it's a mistake for students and academics, especially to only focus on training the model because that isn't actually adding business value. The reality is that it's the ROI that is what's important not how you got to the technical solution. Right. Yeah, uh, definitely. And, and there's, there's kind of two sort of common trajectories you, you see with, with companies. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, one is, is kind of the, you know, start with the technology and then go find, you know, ways to apply it to, you know, to do things and make money. The, the other is start with um, a, a customer or a user and the problem that he or she has, and then figure out a way to build a solution, you know, and, and design the technology around that. And um, there, you know, there are exceptions that are, are very successful with the, the first model, but um, the vast, vast majority of successful companies are, are the second model is, is let's start with a, a user and a, a problem they have, and then, then let's go design their technology ar- around that. Um, and, and that may or may not use machine learning in it. Yeah. Um, well, and, and what I, what I think is very, very interesting is some of these companies that are merging in the pre-trained model space, like hugging face, I think is a very fascinating company in that it, you know, if you had to throw a critique at it, it's like, oh yeah, but they're just hosting, you know, the pre-trained models. It's like, well, you mean like GitHub? You mean like one of the most successful startups of all time? <laughs> like, well, yeah, that, that's true that they're just hosting models, but the just hosting models is now creating an ecosystem that lets people more rapidly apply technology solutions to ROI and try out an idea. So, so that's an, another thing I'm, 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 I'm personally kind of betting for is I think the, the proliferation of pre-trained models, we're, we're, in, we're like 1% of mm-hmm. what it will probably turn into. Yeah. I, I'm also a big hugging face fan and, and use their, you know, use them for a lot of different things. And you're right. Their, their business model is, 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 um, you know, somewhat different, but, it, but it works and there's an important you know place for it and, and a problem they're solving for people, um, you know, across a wide, you know, wide variety of, of, of industries. Um, and, and I think, I also think, you know, pre-trained models are, are certainly the future. Um, you know, it's, it's not, I, I don't know that anybody's, you know, an industry is, is, you know, training models from scratch, you know, to go into production. I, I, I think the vast, vast majority are, are pre-trained and, and will, will continue to be because why, you know, why reinvent the wheel and, and spend all that time and energy to, to um, you know, do that initial training, um, when we can do it as a society, you know, we can do it once and a lot of people can benefit from it. So I, I really, um, I think that's a, a great movement um, that accelerates a lot of companies. And I think one of one of both of our former students is working for one of the pre-trained model companies, right? Like right. The, the, con- the concept makes a lot of sense, which is A, even if you, it would be like me saying, hey, I'm going to, 
I'm going to like, you know, play professional basketball in the NBA. It's like, well, yeah, you can say that, but, but I'm not seven foot tall and 300 pounds and 25. Like I can't like my body won't do what my mind wants to do. Right. So, so like same with the, if you don't have uh, you know, 20,000 GPU cluster with like, you know, uh, petabytes of data, there's certain models that you're just not going to be able to train either. Even if you want to train them, you can't. And then the second is the, for people that are, that are trying to be responsible in terms of, um, not burning up energy that they don't need to, why would you do something worse that, that you could just get for free to your point? Yeah, it's something that's not talked about nearly enough, but the environmental impact of, of training, models, especially large scale models can, can be huge. Um, and I, I saw something the, the other day that within, um, uh, a couple of decades they're, they're, they're forecasting that the, um, the, uh, sort of data and analytics, you know, field is going to consume up to 14 to 18% of, of total uh, emissions in, in the U S. Um, and that, that's a huge number when you think about it. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't have to be like that. Um, you know, if we're smart about doing things once and, and not just doing, you know, the same thing over and over again with different people, um, you know, there, there's no need to spend that time and, and money and, um, uh, you know, and, and then the, the, the power and resulting emissions impact that has as well. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and I'm, yeah, and I, I could even see things like how, especially in terms of, social media i mean it's, it'll be interesting to see what happens in the future because how many things are just the same topic or the same piece of data like a viral video and so if you have a file system that basically only lets one copy of the data exist i mean how much could you shrink you know yeah. like everything like there, there's all these things that are just basically they they don't need to be replicated right yeah, definitely. Good, great point. You know, storage is you know, the prime example of that, and training models is is the other one. So yeah. you you had a you had a kind of an ML ops uh, type product, you know, or AI ops yeah. type product that you 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 developed. Did you want to demo it? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, so um, a, a quick I intro um, to to what this is. Uh, so one of the things I, I found that. Um, I, I talked to a lot of students who, you know, are, are spending a lot of time thinking about jobs and interviewing and, and where am I going to go with my, my career and, and what kind of role and, and so on. And um, I, I found that they, there's kind of two, two big problems that, um, that they tend to have. Uh, the first one is um, it, for the most part, it's, it's unclear to them what the different job roles in the industry are and, and how, how they differ from each other and, and what skills are required for, for each of them. So, you know, in, in my particular case, since I, I teach machine learning, um, a, a lot of people are, are thinking about roles like a uh, you know, software engineer versus a machine learning engineer versus a, a data scientist versus, uh, versus a data engineer. What, what do these different people do that makes them different and, and what skills do I need? for each of them and, and which one's a better fit for me, given the skill set I've, I've built, what should I be focused on in, in terms of my career? Um, you know, for people that have worked in, in industry, like, like you or I, it, it may seem very obvious. It's like, how, how can you possibly, you know, not understand the difference between a data engineer and a machine learning engineer. But, uh, but it, it's really not in, unless you've, you've been in industry for a while and understand those different roles. So for people who, in high school, college, graduate, you know, starting work, it, it's not really not obvious at all what the differences are and, um, and, and what skills you need for each of them. Um, so that, that is kind of the first challenge I've, I've run into with, with my students. And, um, you know, we're fortunate that at Duke, we have a great, great career center and, and we have career advisors who can work for the students, but most people are, are not so fortunate that they have easy access to a, a career advisor, um, and to be honest, a human career advisor cannot be an expert in every industry. You know, um, our career team serves engineering alone, which is great. But even within engineering, there are many different types of roles in different industries. And they're, they're certainly not an expert in, in each one of those to be able to advise students of what, you know, here's the skills you need for this role versus, versus this role. Um, so that's the that's kind of the first problem. And then the second one is once you sort of 
do your your research and you, and you figure out what what type of a, a job you're you're going to shoot for, um, you most likely don't have all the skills you need uh, to to be qualified for that job. And so, you know, you you then go out and and you build those skills. And there are a lot of different ways to do that. You can you can go to grad school and you can take you know think about what classes to take that, that builds the skills you need um, to be prepared for that job. Uh, you can, there's great uh, options. They're free or low cost on, you know, Coursera, Udacity, et cetera. There's a lot of great books out there that are, are good for skill building. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to build skills. Uh, and, and so the second challenge I find students run into is once they've sort of figured out what they, what they want to be when they grow up and what type of role they want to, they want to do, and now, okay, I know I've got, I've got to build these skills. How should I do that? Uh, what classes should I take? What, you know, what should I do online? Um, it, we live in a world uh, where we have an unbelievable amount of educational content out there on, on almost every you know, topic you can imagine, um, which is tremendous and didn't, didn't exist five or 10 years ago. Um, and, and so it's not necessarily a problem of not having the content or access to the content. Um, but the problem is, is it's, it's overload. It's too much. I, I don't know, you know, should I read this book or should I take this Coursera course or this Coursera course or this Udacity thing, or maybe I should take a Duke course or, uh, uh so there's, there's a, a lot of different ways to, uh, to approach things. And so the second problem is this overload problem of not knowing what, how should I go about building these, um, these skills that I, I know I need to build for my role. So, um, that's a little background. So I, I, I have been for a while. I've been working on a, a tool that I, I call Compass, which um, has been really designed uh, for my students um, initially. But I realized that um, that it, it, the benefits can be for a, a lot of folks. I mean, it's certainly not you know limited to grad students at Duke by any means. In fact, probably others can benefit more um, you know than, than Duke students who actually have you know the ability to talk to you or I or, or talk to a career counselor. A, a lot of people don't have that option. Um, and so I've been building this platform called Compass, um, which uh, attempts to solve these two problems. One is is um, providing a, a way for um, uh, students or, or people thinking about a career change to understand different roles and the skills required for different roles, and then um, to find the, the best path for them to go and build those skills that they lack. Um, and, and so it's kind of trying to solve both of these uh, challenges. And I can, um, I'll show you a, a quick demo uh, of it here. Uh, okay. And this is, this actually, so it's in um, kind of an early uh, uh, beta at the moment, um, but it is live. And, and so you're welcome to, to um, go check it out and, and try it out on myskillscompass.com. It's free, um, uh, so uh, feel free to pr play around. And uh, if you do, uh, if you're listening to this and you do check it out, I, I certainly appreciate any any ideas or, or feedback you have. Um, but let's log in here. I'll show you kind of what it what it does. And this is a tool that um, uh, uses some, uh, uses uh, wrong email address machine learning behind the scenes, particularly a a, a good amount of NLP. Um, um, but it does another, a number of other things as well. Um, so when I first log in here, the, the main thing I, I need to do, first of all, is create a, a skills map, which is kind of like a, a profile of, of my skills. Um, and I can add um, uh, hard skills, soft skills, credentials, et cetera. So you can see here on the screen, I've, I've, um, uh, I've started uh, working on this. And so let me, I'm going to add a couple more here just to... Uh, for fun to round this out. So let's say I've got some software skills. Let's just say uh, um, I had a little bit of JavaScript and I'll select my, uh, my current level. It's just I'm competent in JavaScript. Um, I learned this on my own. Um, and so we can build out our skills map, which is if you're familiar with graphs, it's, it's really a, a skills graph actually. So it creates a, a big graph of you and all your skills and, and credentials shows that you, you have. So we'll add a couple more. Um, so let's uh, add some things here. Machine learning. Let's say I'm an expert there. I learned it on the job. So you can go in and you can add skills that you, you've developed either um, through your work experience, through a study that you've done, through um, uh, classes that you've taken, etc. 
Let's add one more here. Deep learning, and let's just say I'm an advanced beginner there, and I learned it. Uh, I took a, a great course at Duke uh, called uh, AIPI 520 that I happen to teach. Uh, okay. All right, so now you can see we built out our map a little bit, and we've got um, we've got a few skills on there, right? And, and um, you can I could continue. I, I could add some other things here, but uh, that's good enough for the moment. So once you've built out your map, um, you can then um, uh, start to explore uh, um, potential career roles that might be a good fit for you, given the skills that you have. So if I go over to here and, and, um, and explore careers. I can see that um, I've got a little recommendation system in here that has um, given the skills I have has now recommended some careers that might be a potential fit for me. And um, looking at this list, I can see that I've done a, a pretty good job. Um, and by the way, I'm, I'm focusing this on kind of data or, or you know, analytics type careers, but it, it's actually built um, uh, for a wide variety of different fields. So when I look at skills, I can add skills in um, business, healthcare, law, uh, you know, science, et cetera. Um, and, and we'll take a look at that. But let's look at some of these um, careers it's recommended to me. So let's take a look at like a data scientist. So I'll, I'll click on that one and um, I'm going to display the skill set here. So now what this does is it shows me a um, kind of a typical skills map of uh, a data scientist. And let me zoom in here a little bit. And I can see here's the um, a, a typical skill set for a data scientist. The larger um, circles indicate skills that are, are, are um, higher in demand for data scientists, more important skills versus the smaller skills. Uh, and then the colors show uh, my current skill level. So I can see the red ones are, are ones that I, I don't have on my skills map today. Uh, the green ones are, are ones that I um, already am proficient or am expert in. And then the, the yellow ones are ones that I've, I've started learning, um, but I'm, I'm not probably strong enough yet. So deep learning, for example, is yellow. Uh, why is that? Because I'm an advanced beginner um, to, to be qualified. I, I probably need to keep improving my skill set a little bit there. Um, and then you can see it picks up some soft skills as well. And so I can look at this and I can kind of visually see how good of a fit I might be for, uh, for a data scientist. Let's take a look at another one. Let's look at a machine learning engineer. Uh, so machine learning engineer, as you would expect, has some some similar skills, but also some different skills, given it's, it's a little bit of a different focus in terms of what they what they do. Um, so some other things, some new things show up here. Hadoop, Spark, um, uh, you know, is showing up where I don't think that was on the data scientist uh, one. Uh, AWS, Scala, um, a few new skills. And these are um, one question that comes up a lot is where, where this, does this come from? Is this somebody's opinion on, on what a machine learning engineer should know how to do? Um, actually, they're created from um, uh, scanning millions of different uh, job postings and job descriptions. And so I, I built a, an algorithm that processes millions of, of postings um, to extract the skills from them and identify for all the postings relating to a machine learning engineer, for example, here's the skill sets that they're asking for, um, at, you know, across the millions of different postings. And then, and then it, it gets refreshed over time because, you know, skill sets do change over time for, for certain careers. Um, so then if I don't, like, if I see a skill that I'm not really sure what, what it is, let's say I, I don't, I've never heard of Hadoop before. Um, I can uh, click on it and I can, I can get a little description of, of what it is here. And I can also see some relevant job roles that, um, where this skill is important, uh, you know. So if I if I do know Hadoop, I can see some some uh, job roles that 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 knowledge of Hadoop might might benefit me in. Okay, and then I can um, I can also get a, a kind of a a, a written view here um, of um, of that as well. So if I look at machine learning engineer, for example, I've got a few skills that are relevant for this job already. And then I've got some suggested skills that I, I might want to build if I want to, um, you know, make a career in, in a machine learning engineer type of a role. And then I can also um, let me go back here. Um, I can also once I, I've figured out, kind of done done some research, I, I can also browse other other jobs, not just the recommended ones. So let's for fun, let's just look at. Um, 
I don't know, something the science is uh, a biologist, let's just say. I've clearly given my, my skill map, I'm, I'm not going to be a biologist type of role. Um, but here's a skill set, a typical skill set for a biologist based on um, you know, job requirements and postings for, uh, for a biologist. And I, as I can see, for, I've got a lot of red circles on there. So this is probably not a great fit for, for me, um, given my, my skill set. Um, so let's go back to my, my recommendations. Let's take a look at uh, data scientists. That was a much better fit for me, it looked like. Let's say I, I, I've done some research and this is, this is, this is what I want to do. I, I feel like data scientist is a good, a good job role for me. Um, I can then set it as my target role. Um, and then the system will keep track of, of that. So now when I come back in here and I can go to explore, explore careers, I've got my target role um, shows up. So I've got kind of this constant reminder of here's, here's the map that I'm kind of shooting for in the skill set that I want to build out um, to be well qualified for getting a job as a, a data scientist. And so this, this allows students or, or others who are thinking about career changes to kind of explore skill sets for different different roles and then look at how 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 your current skill set maps against the skills required for different roles to identify areas where you you may have have some skills that are very relevant and, and applicable to that role and, and you may have some areas here sql for example that i i don't i according to my skill map i haven't developed any competency in sql yet so this is probably something i want to go build some skills in if I want to be uh, working as a data scientist. So um, what this is trying to do is solve that first problem I mentioned of, of understanding how uh, job roles differ and how the skill sets for different job roles differ and, um, and then identifying what skills are required for different, different roles. Um, and then the second thing that it's at this point is kind of a work in progress is once I've got a map of the skills for a, a target job role that I'm, I'm interested in, um, now, what I want to be able to do is provide recommendations in this build skills section of, of how to go about building some of these skills. So, um, if, for example, if, if, you're, if, if you have uh, registered in, in the platform that you're a student, a grad student at Duke, I want to be able to provide you some suggested courses that you might want to think about going and taking um, that can build some of these skills. Uh, or if, if, if you're not, um, you know, there's, there's some great options online. So we might recommend you some Coursera courses, for example, to, to take to build some of these skills. Um, and then as you go through those, you, you further develop your skills and you can go in and you can change your, your skill levels. Um, and then, you know, hopefully you get to the point someday where uh, these circles are all green. And, and that's a, a, a great uh, thing because it means you're very well qualified for, uh, for this type of a role. And one of the other, by the way, for folks listening to this, one of the other important things to note is, uh, you know, job postings and requirements tend to be a little bit of a wish list of, of you know, everything they hope that a candidate, you know, has. But more often than not, um, you know, not a lot of people meet every single request for skills that uh, a job uh, uh, rec has. So um, don't think that you need to have every single skill on the list in order to be qualified. You, you don't. Um, you know, you should have a, a good portion of them, but uh, but it, you don't. You certainly don't have to have every single skill for it to be um, to be qualified and, and be hired for a certain uh, certain job role. Yeah, it's an in interesting concept, and it, like one of the things that I'm uh, an advocate of is that companies should get rid of their hiring process, <laughs> which is kind of a radical thing. But like, if for example, with something like this, if you're able to prove that you have got all these skills like through some you know like you've taken the courses and like in the case of Coursera we you know we we know that actually they do have to validate much of their skills in a Coursera course then in some sense you could have you know a passive hiring process right like you put in all your job rec stuff and then it matches with some thing it's like oh 80 percent match and then you find someone who actually has you know proven um links that prove that these skills have been acquired i mean really do you even need to know who the person's name is you know anything about them that that identifies them at all it could just right. passively you could just give that person a job yeah yeah exactly and, and that's where i hope that um is at some point in the future uh you know things will evolve and um uh, you know you could imagine this if, if you build out your skills map um one of the things that we're adding in is a like you said, kind of a, a proof. So um, you say you're an expert, um, 
what's your, you know, what's your proof? How did you, how did you build those skills? You know, did you pass certain courses? Did you, uh, you know, do certain projects in, in your work experience and, and, you know, previously, um, but if you can build a skills map and have each of those skills, your, your skill level verified in some way, whether it's through, a, a you know, a certified course that you've taken, or, um, you do a little assessment or something to verify your skill. If you could do that, a company in theory could go in and like you said, build a skills map of the job, you know, that they job rec they have, and then just hit search and find candidates that skills map matches, you know, the job that you're searching for um, and, and then go and, and engage those, those candidates. Right. And so we kind of, you kind of move away from the resume and, and there's a lot of documented issues with, with resumes and, and bias and, and other things. Um, but you kind of move away from the resume towards a, a skills based approach to hiring where you're, you're hiring for the skills that somebody has not, not, you know, what big name company was on their resume or what, you know, what school they went to, or if they even went to school, uh, you know, at all. Yeah. And it, it reminds me um, as well of, I'll, I'll share real quick my, my screen here that, like a while back I came up with this, this concept of um, like a, a visual resume where, where, you know, I don't actually need a job ever again, but like, but the, the, at the time I thought, um, I'm going to just put like, you know, like a, a multidimensional view of the things I've done in my life yeah, and, and how they all kind of map together. And, you know, once you, once you started looking at things from like a different perspective, it was like, Oh, well, actually, how do I even say this on a resume that like, like I was working on NFS file systems for like multiple decades. And that's highly related to, you know, big data, right. And, you know, and building things with Unix and Linux have been working on that for decades. That's also highly related with, you know, other things. And, even TV and film that has a, was actually data engineering, but like yours is much, I think better, better. And it's like kind of fine, fine grained approach, but, but yeah, just yet another, you know, example of like how um, I think we're, we're ripe for different kinds of resumes and potentially passive hiring. Yeah, absolutely. That's a cool way to, to, to present yourself. I, I like that. I, I think there's, there's a lot of issues with, with the, the paper resume. And, and I, I think that it's, it's days are probably hopefully are, are numbered and we'll, you know, move away and, and find better ways for, um, you know, for candidates to match with jobs that, that eliminate some of the bias issues and, and, you know, access issues that we, we have today um, with, with our current system. And um, yeah, I, I like that. I like that visual. And, and that's, that's what I, I hope we'll get to eventually with, with this um, is that, um, you know, I know LinkedIn, I think, is working on some similar stuff and, and, and some others, but moving towards a skills based approach to to matching, you know, with with job roles and, and then and then presenting yourself as a candidate for different roles and, and for on the employer side to hire for skills um, and, and not for for names you know, or, or, or credentials um, that somebody has. Yeah. And, and I mean, like there's many, many cases of. Um, of recent history actually of, of, of actually elite, you know, companies, universities where then it, in practice, they're actually not delivering. Right. Like, I mean, and, and so just the name itself is, is not a great signal, you know, that, that it, there has to be more to it. And, and I think the approach you're, 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 you're pointing out, I think is, is, you know, almost in a, a sense, like a direct antidote to, to that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you think about, and, and look, I mean, we, we, we both, you know, we teach with, with Duke and um, uh, Duke is a great school and, and, and there's certainly a lot of value um, in, in coming to a place like Duke, but we also recognize that not everybody can uh, different you know, reasons, location, you know, uh, price access, uh, et cetera. Um, and so it, it's been, fantastic to see the rise of, of alternative paths to, to build skills. Um, you know, you don't have to come to Duke or, or go to a, you know, a, a big name school. Um, there are other options that, that might make sense for you. Um, there are pros and cons of, of every path that you choose. You know, one well, is and, and, and what I like about Duke is that 
the stuff that we, you and I both do, which is that we're able to build courses that is, are very similar in the, in, in the, in the material that, that are actually be able, that are delivered worldwide. And so yeah. I think that's one thing that, that I think that some universities can do that, that, that we're doing, which is that, you know, th there's obviously a different experience, just like, you know, if, if I buy a Mercedes, you know, they're, they're awesome. Right. But they're also a hundred thousand dollars. Right. <laughs> but, right. but, but at the same time, there, there's other mechanisms of transportation that are, they're really good too. But, and so similar, like with a Coursera course, if it's the same material, Right, but it's in a, in a slightly different format. Then, then everybody in the whole world can can get access to it, and then that actually does link directly into the style of thing you're building. Yeah, it's been a great you know great movement towards towards increasing access towards you know education. I, places like Duke and peer universities you know, have some of the best best teachers and, and and best courses in the world, and and it's great to see that there are options now to open those up to a lot of other folks as, as well to consume in different ways. Um, you know, we've both done stuff on, on Coursera, which is a great medium for, for us to be able to bring, uh, you know, the, the courses and, and uh, that we build to, to a lot, a lot more people uh, beyond just the folks that, you know, a small subset of folks that can, can come to Duke and um, open, you know, open source uh, courses, open source uh, textbooks, et cetera, that all of that has been, I think been a great benefit to society because ultimately a, a university is, is, is really a service to society. I mean, it's, it's mandate is to, to educate, um, uh, and not, you know, in, in my mind anyway, you know, educating society doesn't necessarily mean only educating the 40 people that sit in your classroom, but, you know, it means finding other ways to, to educate a, a much larger percentage of the population. And so I'm really, Duke's been, a, a, I think, one of the, you know, one of the early adopters of, of teaching online, and, you know, working with Coursera um, and, and other universities. Stanford's done a, a good job there as well. Um, um, some others, MIT. Um, but it, it's great to see these universities finding ways to leverage technology to, to be able to bring what they the, the great things they can offer the world out to a, a, a much larger population. Yeah, I mean, and I, I agree, like the there, there's I haven't read the book yet and I'm planning to is called effective altruism that, you know, the concept of trying to do as much good as possible as quickly as possible. And, you know, ultimately if for like a university, that should be the goal, right. Is, is, is how do you actually make as much help to the world as, as possible by, you know, like you said, providing a service and, you know, there's many ways to do it and including, you know, building content from Coursera or similar type platforms. And, and that, that actually has been one of the things I've really enjoyed about Duke is I, I mean, honestly, I, I, and I would say like, if I had, if I, if I, if I, if I didn't like Duke, uh, be, because I'm, I'm very honest about things, but I, I've been extremely impressed with just that that style is, is such a big deal you know, in, in the university and, and that there is, you know, knowing that, you know, there's 20,000 people that, that I've helped that are getting jobs in cloud computing or ML ops or, or whatever, you know, that, that feels like uh, I'm, I'm doing something that's helpful, you know, and, and that, that's, that's a, uh, that's the kind of feedback loop that I think the world needs is, is you get positive feedback from, from helping people. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, and, and I, like you, I, I am really impressed with with what folks across Duke are, are doing and, and the focus they put on it. Um, and and it's not you know it's not Duke is like others is not without its challenges. And one of the one of the big challenges there is is just the way that um, the way that most professors who are on sort of the tenure track are are are, are incentivized. And and um, you know when you look at uh, what it takes to, to get to tenure, it's 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 research, teaching, and service, but but the service is really thought of in terms of service to a university, not service to society as a whole. Um, and and I, I really think it, it should be right because you know service to university doesn't necessarily mean go you know go figure out ways to teach the world, uh, but service to society does right. And, and so I, I think you should get credit you know you know towards you know tenure and, and promotions and so on for. Um, you know, engaging, you know, with teaching online, doing Coursera courses, you know, writing books, et cetera, to, to share knowledge and disseminate that to the world, not, not only to, to Duke students. So that, that's one, you know, example of something that a construct that exists in, in higher education today that I think needs to, 
needs to evolve, but, but I've been, um, you know, really happy. The community at Duke is very supportive and, and focused on, um, on finding alternative paths to get our education uh, out. Great. So, so how I, I know this, this um, recording is not only going to be, it's on, you know, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitch, those kinds of things, but it's also going to go up on O'Reilly. Uh, and so, you know, there's millions of people, I don't know if the millions will read it, but there's millions of users on the platform. And then also we'll link it into a book I'm writing on enterprise MLOps. And so I'm sure there'll, there'll be a lot of people that will, will want to contact you. What, what are some ways that, that people can get a hold of you? Yeah. Um, feel free to reach out on um, uh, LinkedIn is probably the, the best bet to, um, to reach out to me. Like I said, I, I'm not active on the, a Twitter or other platforms, but I, I am uh, somewhat active on, on LinkedIn. Uh, just search for John Reif's um, uh, You can find me at Duke too, you know, for people that um, have questions about what we do at Duke, have interest in the graduate program, whatever, um, feel free to email me. I, I think my email is probably up on the, the program website, but my name at, at duke.edu um, and, and feel free to reach out if, if you do want to talk about, uh, about graduate school. Great. And, and it's, yeah. You know, and I, and I bet, you know, probably some people would be interested in like, you know, how hard is it to get in and how can I apply and all that? And they can, they can, I'm, I'm assuming contact you about that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Feel free. We, we try to put a lot of info on the program website. Um, so if you just search for um, like MNJI Duke or masters AI Duke or something, you'll, you'll find their site. And we, we got a lot of information about the program there and the classes and, and, and what makes it uh, unique and how to apply and, and all that, that stuff. You know, we are, a, we are a, a program that um, welcomes people from a very diverse range of backgrounds. Um, uh, you know, we, we have engineers from all, all you know, branches of engineering. We have scientists, we have uh, folks that work in healthcare. Um, and, uh, and, and so sometimes people feel like they have to, you know, if I want a master's in machine learning, I've, I've got to study computer science. Or if I didn't study computer science, I probably can't get in anywhere. That's not the case, um, at, at least not with us anyway. I can't speak for, for other programs. But we do welcome folks from a, a variety of backgrounds, again, because we, we're really firm believers in the, the power of that combination of domain expertise in a certain field and, and skills in, in these technologies of, of AI and machine learning. So... Um, feel free to check out the information on our website. You can certainly reach out if you have any any specific questions. Awesome. Well, yeah, I think we had a great conversation and yeah. it will be help a lot of people. And uh, I'm sure we'll maybe have a conversation again in the future. Yeah, that sounds great. Thanks for, for hosting me on here, Noah. Um, really enjoyed our, our conversation today. And for all the folks listening in, uh, thanks for listening.